Thank you so much for your testimony. We're going to go with the last panelist, uh, and then we will uh, open up for questions. Good morning, uh, Good morning, Chairman Jones and members of the Committee on Public Safety. Uh, my name is Scott Charles, and I'm the Trauma Outreach Coordinator for Temple University Hospital, where my primary role um, involves trying to reduce the number of firearm injuries that we treat at Temple specifically, as well as the injuries that are treated at other trauma centers more generally. One of the initiatives that I oversee at Temple is the Cradle to Grave program, uh, which has educated more than 10,000 young people about the medical and emotional realities of gun violence over the past decade. I also direct a program called Fighting Chance, which enlists hospital staff to teach first aid to residents living in communities suffering high rates of firearm injury. Finally, I run a program out of the hospital called Safe Bet, in which I distribute free gun locks to our gunshot patients, many of whom have uh, children, grudges, and guns, but unfortunately no gun locks. Some might consider it odd that a hospital would find itself in the business of distributing gun locks. Uh, when you think about it, however, it shouldn't really come as that big a surprise. Temple University Hospital treats more gunshot injuries than any other hospital in the state of Pennsylvania. In the 11 years that I've worked for the trauma department, we have treated more than 5,000 patients for firearm injuries. In Philadelphia, firearm injury is the leading cause of death for young black men in the city. Um, and combined, gun suicide and homicide represent the leading cause of death outpacing even motor vehicle accidents for all Pennsylvania juveniles under the age of 21. Simply put, juvenile firearm injury is a public health issue. I am aware that some might take exception to my referring to firearm injury as a public health issue. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to take you back to October 16, 2014, when Dr. Herb Cushing, Temple University Hospital's chief medical officer came before this distinguished group to discuss the significant efforts being made by our health system, as well as those being made by the city, state, and federal government to address the threat posed by the Ebola virus. At the time, there were only three known cases of Ebola on American soil. In total, there have only been four diagnosed cases of Ebola in the U.S., and no one person has both contracted and died of the virus while in this country. Few, however, would argue that uh, Ebola represents a legitimate public health issue. And today, uh, those four cases have had a powerful effect on public health policy and practice. Now, if I might, I'd like to take you to the present um, to talk about why it is that we see this as a, a critical issue for us. Sandusky, Ohio, police investigating seven-year-old shot in the neck. Cumberland, Indiana, nine-year-old boy dies after being shot in the head near Indianapolis. Georgia, seven-year-old boy injured in accidental shooting in northwest Atlanta. Roanoke, Virginia, police say one child playing with guns shot and killed another child. Marshall County, Alabama, funeral set for 10-year-old killed in accidental shooting. LaPlace, Louisiana, LaPlace mourns the loss of five-year-old killed in accidental shooting. Colorado, Denver three-year-old wounded in accidental shooting. What I just read to you does not represent a year's worth of headlines. Rather, these are all cases of unintentional shootings of American children that happened just this past week. Closer to home of Philadelphia, second grader at Grover Cleveland Mastery Charter last week made national news when he brought a fully loaded Glock handgun to school in the Tioga section of the city. The week before that, just outside the city, a Penwood Middle School student was arrested after it was discovered he had stashed a 40 caliber handgun in his locker. Fortunately, neither of these local cases ended in tragedy, but many other children in many other cases are not so lucky. On average, a child unintentionally shoots him or herself or someone else in their home or vehicle at least every other day in this country. In fact, this year alone, nearly 100 children have been involved in unintentional shootings as a result of having gained access to a firearm that was left unsecure and loaded. Despite the constant drumbeat of such tragedies, gun owners, and I account myself among them, continue to fail to take the steps necessary to prevent what is easily one of the most preventable forms of childhood injury that exists. One common assumption among gun-owning adults is that their children are unaware of the location of their firearms, and even if they did know, would never touch them. This assumption often leads to reckless firearm storage practices that can have lethal consequences. It has become increasingly evident that the possibility of losing a child alone is not sufficient motivation for some gun owners to properly secure their weapons. As a result, I support the passage of child excess prevention laws such as this, um, and those that have uh, proven to be effective in reducing accidental shootings of children um, by as much as 23 percent. 
Among states with highest levels of gun, uh, child gun deaths, seven of 10 do not have child access prevention laws. Among states with low levels of child gun deaths, seven of 10 do have child access prevention laws. As a health professional who regularly witnesses the devastating effects that bullets have on the human body, as the parent of, a ch of children who live near and attend school with the children of other Philadelphia gun owners, I support any legislation that might reduce the likelihood of firearms finding their way into the hands of individuals who are too young to appreciate the consequences of their actions. I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.